Hello again, and welcome to the Gospel of Mark. I'm enjoying this course more than I even thought I would, and that's saying a lot. It's great working with Father Mike Listeri, who is the pastor of Immaculate Heart of Mary Parish here in Hanford, and also the director of the Evangelization and Worship Office for our Diocese of Fresno. And it's really great working again with Dr. Robert Maldonado from California State University, Fresno, a philosopher who is also a biblical scholar specializing in the book of Mark. It's great to have them share their insights as preachers, priests, and academics on the topic of their favorite gospel. We're in the middle of chapter 4 of Mark, and as we begin, I wonder, Robert, is there some bridge to make with anything we've done up to now to get us ready for where we're going to begin with chapter 4, verse 26? Well, last week we left off with those difficult sayings, and, and these are troubling ones to me personally because I'm not quite sure what to make of them. And, and one of the things I've been focusing on more recently is, is, is actually thinking them as a, as a negative example and, and not actually positive content. Because what Jesus says is basically look at what you hear. Pay attention to what you hear. And then it says the measure you give will be the measure you get and still more will be given to you. And those that have more will be given from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. He may not be saying that positively. He may be giving that the example of what you should pay attention to hear. And so listen to this. This is what people say, them that's God get, them that don't lose. And, and it's actually a judgment of that. It's saying that's not the way it is with God's kingdom wow. because in God's kingdom, it's extravagant hundredfold production. Uh, that, that is awesome to begin with because it was kind of a, a cloudy thing that we were working with is the gospel is about abundance. And yet at the end, it just sounded like if we read it one way, it was actually calculated. It was actually diminishing. It was measuring. It was almost negative. But to have Robert recover the positive thrust of Mark's message, that's really great. And when we read something, that first read might be off that first thought we get. I remember Otto Ippoli used to tell me, the first time you read it, you're wrong. Go deeper. Find something else, something you're not used to, something you're uncomfortable with. Thank you, Otto. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Michael. And I thank Otto, too. He was my professor. Otto Ippoli, <laughs> wonderful, wonderful biblical scholar. And, and for his memory that Mike, Father Mike and I share, Robert, you would have liked the man. Mm -hmm. uh, could we begin, Robert, with um, 426? And he said, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed upon the ground and should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should sprout and grow. He knows not how. The earth produces of itself first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. And when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. And he said, With what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which, when sown upon the ground, is the smallest of the seeds of, on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. Thank you very much. Now, what we do have here are some very um, interesting parables that have been sort of put together by Mark. He has lined up three. We saw one last week. I wonder if that first um, pericope from 426 to 429, if there's any insights we'd like to share on that to separate it from the other two little pieces. Anything on those first four verses that you'd like to open up? Well, I think the kingdom of God, while it keeps coming up, I guess it gets more solidified as it goes along. Uh, it becomes a real theme for Mark. And again, the con I, we talked about that earlier as we opened the show, but I think, it, again, it's that contradiction of what to expect, what the kingdom has to offer compared to the lived experience of the local people. Since I think Jesus really does come to give hope to those who've lost hope, a sense of life in spite of death in many 
ways, and not just physical uh, death and life. But I think he's putting out that sense of hope. There is that sense that there is something different waiting for you. And how the seed can and will sprout and grow, um, it will, in the kingdom, have a real measure. And a measure will be much greater than they can anticipate. And I think I think it's real important for the people of this time, as it is for us as well. But I think the crowd need to hear that, and he is, if you will, speaking to them. Robert, this passage, we read it in our Catholic lectionary, the 11th Sunday of year B. It's unique to Mark. Why didn't the other evangelists pick it up? Well, I, I actually think that's one of the most intriguing questions, is, is most scholars think that Mark, uh, Matthew and Luke are, uh, have some access to some version of Mark, and uh, on the face of it, there doesn't seem to be anything that objectionable about this, you know, seed growing, it's kind of nice, uh, good image, uh, and, and it makes me wonder if they actually did see something kind of negative in it, uh, because you know it's it's actually not the case that seed typically just grows by itself uh, when it's for harvest. You know you have laborers, you have others, and of course this man is benefiting from that labor, uh, even though it's just kind of magic to him. It just happens uh, until until the harvest, uh, and it's going to be compared right after that with the mustard seed, which is just this nothing thing that then becomes shelter for the birds of the air. So it's it becomes. Uh, a, a haven for uh, for anybody who needs it, and and so I think there's a kind of double edge to this parable of the seed growing secretly. Uh, on the one hand, it's got this kind of negative uh, people are benefiting from the labor of others, uh, and to them it's just as if it's magic. Uh, but then on the on the deeper level, to use your professor's. <laughs> Uh, example, uh, there's, uh, it is a mysterious process. It does just happen. Nobody makes it grow, it's, it's, but God, it's natural. And, and the kingdom should be like that too, uh, so that there's a kind of yes and no, and maybe, the, maybe Matthew and Luke saw the no, uh, and, and that was enough for them to leave it out. What I think, I, I wonder if maybe this is a, a good idea of what grace is, Sometimes we are so calculating in how we want things to be in our spiritual life, we just don't leave room for grace. And grace is God's working in spite of, in spite of ourselves. It's got nothing to do with being good. You don't merit grace. It's a gift. It's what God is. And I wonder if maybe Robert's onto something again. We, who are in the Matthew-Luke motif want things more legislated, want things more calculated, want things more, you do things by a method. And grace works willy-nilly. It works as it works. Secretly, mysteriously, you don't have to do much about it. Just keep out of its way. Isn't that the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God, God isn't expecting anything from us. What he has to offer, he does so out of pure love. So I think that's where the trouble comes in. And, and sometimes the challenge for people, if it becomes a negative thing, it's, it's like, well, how can they um, deserve it? They didn't work for it. And God loves us simply because of who we are, his creation. He, he's not asking us to do anything for that. That's a very hard thing to do. And I think and it's a very good point uh, that Robert brings up. I think sometimes... Um, even in the Gospels, maybe the different philosophies that come through is people were uncomfortable with that concept back then. And somehow you needed to merit Jesus' love and, and, and salvation. And when Jesus comes, to desire simply out of pure love to do it for us. So it is. It's that contradiction. The kingdom of God is, is really a, a basket of contradictions in so many ways. Speaking of basket, if we could move to... Another image, but not the, the basket exactly, but the mustard seed. The next passage that, that Robert read is about the mustard seed, how it's so small, but it grows so big. This one the others do pick up and kind of do it very simply following Mark. What is being presented here that's a little bit different than what we've already seen with seed on the ground? Now, this is the third seedy parable. Where's it going, Robert? 
Well, it's, it's interesting, too, not just in terms of the seed, but that the birds of the air, you know, because the birds, the last we saw them last week, were the ones that were gobbling up the other seed, right, as a, as a kind of negative thing. Uh, I, I'm not sure that that pulls into here. Uh, uh, clearly, the shelter is, is an, important, uh, an important part here. Uh, again, I just think the, you know, the kind of uh, uh, surprised by... Uh, the fortuitous circumstance, right? That uh, in the in the new reign of God, uh, shelter is provided sort of naturally, whereas in the in the reign of the world, shelter is something you might be fortunate to have, uh, but you you it's not something that is simply uh, provided. And and so I think the the sort of the world and the and the way God is going to do it are being contrasted here. Um, is there something about this tree um, or shrub bush that is so massive? Uh, we know there's a lot of hyperbole in all the parables, so we're not surprised that it's not the smallest of seeds, but he says it is. It's not the biggest of trees, but it's, 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 it's big enough. Besides the hyperbole, is there something about bringing to the persons who hear it some images from other readings, from other scriptures, from other traditions that give them the idea of just how expansive this growth is going to be, just how big a deal it is going to be. Such I as... I would turn it back on you. Are you I saying? would turn it back on. Okay. What if it's the idea of the outreach to nations? That, in other words, this kingdom, because Jesus says, with what can I compare it? It's so broad and big, it's going to be so a shelter for all the birds of all the air of all the world. Is this meaning, think big, it's a bigger church than you thought it was. Hmm. My message is broader than you few people, or what? Or is that off point? I, I don't know. You know, as, as I think about it, I don't know if Jesus was at that point thinking in terms of, of church or that, but I think, again, if we could just, who he's speaking to, what's this crowd listening the small crowd that has been faithful to him, those who have gotten the message, um, they're probably still small in number. And could the seed be, it's a small group, but you have the capability to do great things. And again, the mystery of the kingdom is a small seed, it finds, if you will, a home, it germinates even in the hearts of a few, and it can and will become great. But I think he needed to give hope to those who were, who were getting the story. But it was a small group of people and in, in, a, in a big city or in, in the countryside, whatever it was. But they needed to be told that there may be a few of you, but the few of you will grow and become something other than what you are right now. And maybe that's, again, that sign that the small seed, the large tree, community will grow. Stay faithful. Keep listening. Keep walking with me. Um, you'll see a lot of things coming I think, I, I think the uh, shelter is important there in terms of uh, later in chapter 10, uh, Mark's going to have Jesus give a number of, of things that you leave when you start following Jesus and what you get back. And one of the things you leave is your house uh, and what you get back are houses. And, and it explicitly says here and now. It, it, so it's not sort of like heaven. It's, it's in this world. And, and clearly that's the church, I think, uh, provide, the community providing for Mark's followers. And, and so it is the shelter, I think, the, is, the, is where the emphasis really falls. Excellent. Um, shelter from the storm, we may say, and that brings us to our break because next time we're going to be looking at the storm at sea and how the scene has changed, but we are still going to find Mark's message coming loud and clear as Jesus rebukes the storm. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome back to our study of the Gospel of Mark. We've been doing now parabolic interpretations We've really learned a lot, I think, about uh, the seedier side of life. And it's been, it's been good, actually, seeing how Mark has lined up three in a row 
And now there's going to be three um, actual um, miracles in a row because this guy has a real method to his, I was going to say madness, but that's another story we're going to take in chapter 5. So stay tuned. But right now, let's look at the storm at sea, which seems to come out of nowhere, but believe it or not, there's a real order to all of Mark. And Father Mike's going to read the story and we're going to look at why it's inserted here. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great storm of wind arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care if we perish? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was great calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you no faith? And they were filled with awe and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and sea obey him? Well, Robert, you said we we have to leave at least half a show for these uh, few verses because it's that important and it's that deep. Um, Crack open part of it for us. Uh, Difficult to know exactly where to start. There's so much. Uh, Certainly the end is a good place, I think, because the disciples' questions, remember the disciples are not the positive character here, uh, and their question is a little uh, critical of them, uh, but it also becomes a question for the reader, right? Because as characters ask questions, uh, the, the question becomes the reader's question, too. You know, we're, we're kind of like the disciples. We're watching Jesus do these, say these strange things, do strange things. Uh, who is this? Uh, and, and what kind of person is he? What, what, what is he about? Uh, the other thing that's really uh, intriguing about this is the character of Jesus. Uh, because he is uh, oddly passive uh, and and at the same time very powerful, right? Because he's going to rebuke the, the storm and, and stop it. So he clearly has power. Uh, but the way he's described is, is quite passive. Uh, the disciples take him in the boat just as he was. Uh, it's, it's very strange. You know, he, he gives kind of a suggestion. Let's go to the other side. Matthew changes this. So when Matthew says uh, he gives orders to go across... Uh, and he gets in the boat, and they follow him into the boat. So Matthew depicts the disciples much more positively as disciples. They are following Jesus in the boat after Jesus gives orders. Whereas in this one, Jesus is taken, almost like he's carried into the boat. You know, can't he, can't he get in? And then, of course, he's asleep. Now, Mark is the only one who notes that he's asleep on a cushion. Uh, most scholars think that that's probably a reference to the pilot position. Uh, so it's even worse because Jesus isn't just asleep in the boat, he's asleep at the wheel, uh, which of course makes the disciples' question all the more understandable. Don't you care that we're perishing? Uh, which seems to suggest you should be steering. Uh, and, and so you know the disciples want Jesus to be the more in charge, or at least not asleep at the wheel. Uh, and so it's just, it's a very strange, strange uh, element to the story. Uh, and then he gets up, he berates the disciples in very uh, harsh way, uh, almost as if he never expected them to do the right thing. Uh, Matthew reverses this order of rebuke and uh, of the storm and of the disciples. Uh, almost, you know, the storm's going on and he says, how come you have such little faith? It's no, he changes it from no faith to little faith. So they, they have some in Matthew, whereas in Mark they have no faith. Uh, and, and then uh, the storm's going on and he's, he's clearly teaching them uh, so the implication in Matthew is that they should have done this on their own, whereas in Mark, it doesn't seem like Jesus has any expectation that they're going, they're, they're going to have done it right. Uh, and then they're left scratching their heads, you know, who is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him. It's, it's quite something. You know, you're, you're quite something. When 
you ask Robert to just you know make a little effort here to give us an opening to it, it's amazing how much in a single passage or in a single verse, how much is there. And one thing that's really amazing for you, I hope, as it is for me, is to appreciate that the first gospel by Mark, Mark's effort, is, is masterful. It's not haphazard. It's not like a first draft, like, and then the others could really work with it because it was giving you some, like, good stuff, but it's, like, raw. This is well edited. This is, it's rough language, okay, and it's kind of like it runs and it runs and it runs, but it's uh, structured very carefully. It's precise. And Robert's bringing up many examples of where there's a, a genius at work. There's an artist using words and images. Father Mike, you've preached on this. You've read this many, many times. What else besides what Robert just shared is, is for you in here needing to be elucidated? Well, again, I think, um, as was said, um, it's a very passive Jesus. And the storm is going on. And I think not only the natural storm, but the apostles uh, are the, the disciples, those who are following him. They're, obviously, there's a lot of emotional storming going on because they're all agitated and what's happening and so on. And just kind of like, what's the big deal? And he rebukes, if you will, the wind, uh, peace be still, and so on. And um, as he says, why were you afraid? Where's your fear coming from? And I think as a preacher, homilist, oftentimes you have to really deal with fear because people live in so much fear. Um, recently, on the fifth Sunday of Lent, we talked about uh, death, uh, the whole story of Lazarus. We fear death. We fear so many things we can't control. We are totally, if you will, helpless, and yet... Uh, Jesus was able to enter into that story and through a miracle was able to calm. But still in the midst of it, there was a lot of things going on. I think, again, it's what are, you, what are we afraid of? What is the fear we have? And Jesus kind of wakes up, if you will, and takes matters in the hand, but says, where does fear and faith work together? With each other, against each other, all that kind of, if you have faith, then do you have fear? If you have fear, where is your faith? As a homeless, you need to bring that up all the time because people live lives of fear. They're, they're afraid of everything. And yet, if you really believe that you're a disciple of Jesus and you're a part of the kingdom of God, is all that fear warranted? Robert, um, Father Mike helped us see in a contemporary setting how this is a very relevant text. It's one you'd want to use, fear and faith. Bringing us back to the time of the gospel, help us appreciate that community, the Markin community, and how this gospel um, would have been speaking to them? Well, I think uh, picking up there, uh, when he stills the storm, uh, it says he rebukes the wind. And the, the rebuke word is almost exclusively used in Mark for exorcisms. And so the, the, the storm has demonic... Uh, qualities to it in this in the story, and what he says, uh, it's usually translated "peace be still." I, I don't remember the yeah, exact. Uh, uh, is is uh, literally uh, silent silence be muzzled, you know. So shut up, be muzzled, uh, and so he's keeping it from speaking, uh, and and so there's all these kind of speech imageries of negative speech that's being silenced by, you know, demonic speech that's being, the wind that's being uh, silenced. Uh, and, and so that's, that's something. I think the other thing that's really important to bring out is all the way back in 36, uh, there's this, a little detail that simply says, other boats were with him. And most scholars just kind of dismiss that. They say, you know, Matthew and Luke leave it out because these other boats never come back. They don't have any significance that we can tell. Uh, some suggest maybe it was a cue for an oral teller to fill in the story, but since we don't have the oral tradition anymore, we can't know what it is. I think all those explanations are interesting, but I think they missed the point uh, because these other boats, I think it's important that they're never referred to again. 
Because remember, again, the disciples are the sort of negative example. The crowds are the more positive example. And so the question is, where's the crowds? We know that the disciples are with Jesus in the boat and they're not behaving well, uh, but these other boats were with him. And, and so I think the other boats were the crowds. And they're not bothered by the storm. They just get to where they're going. And so they become the example sort of almost by their absence of how not to be in a storm. Uh, and maybe Jesus asleep at the wheel is actually the kind of positive uh, example uh, that uh, kind of like the seed growing secretly, uh, the, the, the sound and fury signifies nothing, right? You know, the wind, uh, the demonic wind is not powerful in relation to the reign of God. Uh, and, and so the other boats, I think, are just absolutely crucial, even though they're so small, so such a small detail uh, in this story. Another small detail might be to bring us back to um, chapter one of our favorite gospel. That would be Mark, um, verse um, 23 all the way through 28. And it uses that same vocabulary that Robert mentioned. It's with demons that Jesus uses this word. Here it is, just hearing it and saying, it sounds like we just did it now. And immediately there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be still and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing, crying out in a loud voice, came out. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching. With authority, he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. So much similar vocabulary. Robert, we have 20 seconds. Is Mark meaning us to go back to what I told you in chapter 1? I I think so, and I think it's interesting the powerful voice is being silenced. Uh, On that note, knowing that Mark is going to do this over and over again, we're going to be looking for him to lead us in a direction and pull us back to another story to say, we dealt with this earlier, This is what Jesus does. This is who Jesus is. This is who you are. Why don't we become more like him? Till next week, God bless.